so thankful for Gary Lanier. He has been such a blessing in my life. I've, even years before I knew Gary, I was singing his music. But he has been struggling for a long time with his cancer. And I want us to pray for him, especially today. Heavenly Father, your grace is so sufficient. It is sufficient for all that we ever face. We thank you for that stream of living water that refreshes us. Lord, sometimes when we get low and we think the world can't get any uglier, we say, Lord, help us be a part of the difference. And that living water inside of us is what gives us the strength and the power. It's, it's the Holy Spirit in us, Lord, and I pray that we will let your spirit shine through us more each day. Lord, we lift up Gary Lanier to you this morning and Belita. We thank you for how they have blessed us over the years. He was raised in this church, nurtured in this church, and now he is nurturing people all over the world with his wonderful music. Lord, we pray for healing for Gary today. We pray for encouragement for Gary and for Belita. We pray especially right now for uh, Tyna Walden. We pray, Lord, that there, uh, there will be, perhaps maybe it will just be a dislocation that they can put into back into place. But whatever it is, Lord, we pray your strength and help and encouragement right now because we know that she's probably still in pain. Lord, at times we're all in pain whether it's physical pain or spiritual pain or material, financial, social, but we place it all in your hands, our Lord and our God, in whose name we make this prayer, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Now, I want us to sing the beautiful song, I've come to the garden alone, and he walks with me and he talks with me, and he tells me,
even with your masks on. You're very attractive. And I am thrilled to see you every Sunday because some churches are still not meeting. My nephew told me yesterday that T.D. Jakes is preaching from his desk in his study. But we're awfully glad to see you. Now, I'm over 80 years old and I, no one's ever told me I was beautiful. But you, except for right, you all are beautiful. And I want you to know that when you leave and go home and take Christianity with you out into the world. And pray for our folk who are still a little bit nervous about getting out. I talk to some of them every week and they apologize for not being here because some of them, like Linda Penny told me, she said, I'm with you online. And of course, Linda's had her hands full with Tommy's uh, surgery and so forth. And she's, she's, I don't know how she does all she does. She's a great lady. So pretend that you are virtually moving around the room and loving on each other because that's the way we are in Christ.
I want to say welcome to all those who are watching us. Uh, makes us feel good to know that you're there, that you care enough about our church and the gospel, the Lord Jesus, to be a part of this. We hope that when our folk give, that you will give online. We loved taking the Lord's Supper with you last week, and we will do that again. We want everybody who's watching and who's a part of us, even though invisible to us, to know that we are aware that you're there. And we thank you for being there. We hope that you'll come back and be there again next week. My title for my sermon is The Awesome Power of Prayer. I was happy with it until my nephew, who spent the day with us yesterday, told me that when he worked for Chuck Swindoll, y'all know Chuck Swindoll, Chuck made a big point of telling his staff, be careful how you use the word awesome. Because awesome is really all, all, inspiring. In other words, awesome is such a powerful adjective, it really only refers to God. Because God is the only thing in the world that truly inspires all in those who experience Him. I tend to agree with that, but I'm not going to change my title. Because I think talking to that wonderful God is pretty awesome too. And I hope that when you leave today that you will feel like you're better equipped to pray. That if you've been letting your prayer life slip, that you will pick it up again. That you will find what Jesus said so exciting that you'll want to be a part of it. So I asked the question uh, in front of reading the scripture, what is prayer? You'd be thinking about that as Jesus tells us what he thinks it is. Matthew 6, beginning at verse 5, through 15. Matthew 6, verse 5 through 15. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Thus ends the reading of God's word for this morning. I'm so glad Jesus told us what prayer really was. Without his words, we would be impoverished in our efforts to pray. Jesus said one time when he was cleansing the temple of the money changers and the livestock, my house was to be called a house of prayer. I wonder what we would have to throw out if Jesus came to check us out. 
I hope nothing. But I wonder sometimes if what we have made the church do to run our programs sometimes goes beyond the emphasis on prayer. One of the things that I have loved about our deacons is they pray. They love to pray. They love to pray together. And a good one-third to one-half of our meetings is taken up with prayer, actual prayer, people talking to God and others praying along with them. Prayer, then, is an effort. I made this up. This is my definition of prayer. An effort of believing that you can actually commune with the one who spoke the world into existence. Think about that. This didn't just happen. It happened on command. The light that's outside this building, everything in this building, especially you precious saints, you are God's handiwork. He created you just like he created the universe. And the universe is so much bigger than we know. Think about talking to that person anytime you want to. Prayer connects us to the greatest source of energy in creation. The greatest source of energy is God's voice. When he says something should be done, it is done. Now let's be honest. As important as we all are, as beautiful as we all are, we're not going to get an invitation to go talk to the president. Whether you like him or not, you'd probably be impressed if he wanted you to come spend a few hours with him and have lunch at the White House. It's not going to happen, is it? You're not going to get a chance to talk to the Pope either. He's busy. He's not going to be able. He's trying to get dressed. That's why he's busy. And uh, he's not going to invite you to come to the Vatican and spend some time with him. For that matter, there's not a single celebrity alive who's gonna call you today and want you to come see him. You know, there's some people I'd like to see. Kate Blanchett will not return my phone calls. Never mind. I was just kidding. Those celebrities, major or minor, the governor, the mayor, and business leaders in our community that we see on television constantly, they are too busy to spend some time with us. They would not consider us important enough to spend time with us. You know I'm right. Here's my point, and you know what I'm saying. Anytime you want to, you can talk to the creator of the universe. Why would you whine because the Pope hadn't called you lately? That's the world we live in. And Jesus got up early, was careful not to step on the sleeping body in the dark room at Peter's house, and he slipped outside and he went off to pray by himself before anybody else got up. And he had spent an exhausting evening healing everybody in the community that was brought to the house that night. It was after sundown and the the Sabbath was over and they could bring everybody who was sick and they didn't have a hospital. They didn't have any doctors or drug stores. Nobody to help the sick. And when one showed up, Jesus was there. And he exhausted himself. And therefore, he needed to go restore the energy that he had used up. They found him. Tried to get him to come back. The waiting room was already full again. But Jesus said, I didn't come just to heal, but to proclaim the kingdom of God. So my first point is the awesome power of prayer is awesome because it connects us to the greatest source of energy in creation. Now, I can read your minds. You, know, you can't hide anything from me. I know some of you are saying, okay, Lord, we know that. We've known that a long, long time. Is that why you spent three hours in prayer yesterday? Me too. I did spend three hours watching television, though. I spent three hours talking to my family. 
the little great granddaughter came over last night and I watched her play for at least three hours when I didn't fall asleep. John Bassanio, for 30 or 35 years, was pastor of the First Baptist Church in Houston. When he went there, the church was running about 400 in Sunday school and in worship. 35 years later, they were running 5,000, 6,000, 8,000. He really was used of God to bring a church back from the brink. John flew a lot in those days. He got a lot of invitations to go speak to places, and he was on the airplane. He loved to do this. He'd start talking to the person next to him, a stranger. And inevitably, they'd say, what do you do for a living? And uh, John would say, I, I, <laughs> my daddy owns this airline. Really? Who is your daddy? Well, my heavenly father owns everything. He made every star in the sky. He created the planets. He created all the cosmos and the universe. And the person inevitably would say, why did he go to so much trouble? And John would always say, what trouble? It wasn't any trouble for God to create the world. He spoke it into existence. Think how important light is. Let there be light. Boom, there was light. That's the kind of God I'm telling you right now that you can talk to. You can even talk to him while I'm talking to you. It'll be all right. In Ephesians 3.20, it says that God can do more than we can ask or imagine. Now, I, I, I can understand the asking part. I'm pretty good about asking. But my imagination is not nearly as strong to take up there and go way beyond what I even know. My imagination is impoverished. I don't know what to ask for because I can't think of it. But they tell me, Paul tells us, that God can take care of even our imagination. And we'll come back to that verse a little later. Point number two. The awesome power of prayer is awesome because it's a, it connects us to the greatest source of energy in ourselves. He said, what are you talking about now? I understand God's powerful, but we're not powerful. No, we're not, not the way God is, but there is something inside of us. Are you listening? There's something inside of us that connects with God's power, and that is our faith. Our ability to imagine, our ability to project on God the things that we think we should want or that the world needs or that we could do for Him. One of our great missionaries said, I ask great things from God, expect great things from God. And that's where we miss it. We ask, but we don't expect. Expecting means you have to believe it. You have to step out on faith. So many times when Jesus healed somebody, he asked for them to give some indication of their faith. Reach out your hand, take up your bed and walk. Open your eyes, wash your, your eyes down in the river. He always wanted something to be done in nearly every case. And so the power that we have in us is the power of believing that what he says is going to happen. Now, walk with me again through the text. When you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand down there on the corner. And during all the red and green and yellow lights, they just pray and pray and pray. And people are impressed. And some people point at them. And pe some people yell compliments to them. He said, that's all the praise that they're going to get, what they get from the other bystanders. If you do that, being seen, admired, and pressing passers-by with your piety, that's it. That's all the reward you're going to get. The way not to be like that, like the hypocrites, is to go to your room. Don't stand out in the middle of the street. Go to your room. Go inside your room and shut the door. And if you have a closet, go inside of it. Now Jesus is using oriental hyperbole. What's he saying? He's saying don't do it for show. Don't pray long prayers, even short prayers for show. Now I did one time, I honestly did. I'll confess it to you. Jess Moody, I was working with him and 
Uh, I had been reading all through my high school years, college years, about Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall was the chaplain of the Senate. He, he was amazing with short prayers. And I was trying to, to copy and emulate Peter Marshall. So one Sunday morning, my only job, my only job on the staff was to say the prayer after the scripture had been read. 2,000 people sitting in this beautiful First Baptist Church in West Palm Beach, Florida. And I went up there one morning. I'm embarrassed to tell you this. And I said, Dear Lord, Jesus was right and sat down. Amen. And I had a few people say, well, that was something that made me think. But most of the people probably thought, show off. You just want to be seen because you did something kind of clever. Well, I've been guilty of that a lot of my life. So that's what Jesus is forbidding. When you pray, don't even tell your mother or your wife or your, your husband. Don't tell anybody that you pray. Do it to the one who sees in secret and the one who sees everything that's done in secret, good or bad, will reward you. Because he's listening. He is listening. Well, what are the rewards you get when you pray like this? He said you will, he'll reward you. Well, I don't know that any of us will come out of our closet with our faces shining like Moses' was. Remember how his face shone because he'd been in God's presence. The Shekinah glory was reflecting off of his skin even after he got down. And finally, when it faded, he wore something over his face so that people wouldn't know that it faded. God will not share his glory with us, even though he wants to share his time with us. So, neither should you pray lengthy, repetitive prayers. If the priest tells you to pray 40,000 Hail Marys, don't pay any attention. You don't get heard because of the number of prayers or mantras or stock praises. And can I throw this in? Will you not still love me if I do this? I am as guilty as anybody in this room. The word just. You ever heard that in a prayer? Lord, we just come to you this morning. We just want you to know how much we love you. Nothing wrong with that, but every other word is just. And that's because we don't listen sometimes to ourselves and pray having thought through what we want to say. Now this, this takes a little doing. It's been hard for me to learn how to do it. But I think we're getting awful close to babbling when we repeat a word over and over and over and over in our praying. You don't do that to each other when you're talking to each other. And by the way, that's how you pray. Just like you talk to each other. There's no special prayer language. Just talk to God the way you talk to each other. Be honest with Him. If you're angry with Him because He didn't do what you wanted Him to do, tell Him. God can handle your anger. It does not put him off. One time, Jess loved to tell this story. Jess was in a revival meeting with, with one of his buddies who was a song leader, right? And they called Brother So-and-So, one of the deacons, up to the pulpit to pray during the revival service. And uh, he prayed, and he prayed, <laughs> and he kept praying. And so this song leader, pretty clever guy, he just went to the microphone, kind of nudged the guy away, and he says, while Brother Bill is finishing his prayer, we're going to stand and sing number so and so. It's going to be like in the book of Acts, we're going to sing and pray at midnight. Well, I wouldn't do that. I never would have had the courage to do that. But don't repeat your prayer words to, to God, because he doesn't need you to do that, because he already knows what you need. He knows what your bank balance is. He knows how much you've got invested and saved. You don't have any secrets from God. He's right there with you. And he wants to hear your prayers. Our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. This is the prayer Jesus gave us. 
He's all of our fathers. Holy is your name. Do you know God's name? It's not just God. In the Hebrew, there are two words. The oldest of the two is Yahweh, and the young, the less old is Elohim. Elohim is a plural word, and Yahweh, they didn't put any vowels in it, so we're not even sure how to pronounce it. It's just four letters, Y-H-W-H. It's called, and I have to show off with my seminary word, a tetragrammaton, which means four letters. Four letters. We don't know what the vowels were. We, we stuck an A between, between the first two and an E between the last two so we know how to pronounce it. But you don't have to know how to pronounce Yahweh or Elohim in order to pray. Our Heavenly Father, He is a Father and He is in Heaven, but He is not far from us. May Your Kingdom come on earth like it is in Heaven. May things go the way you want them to on earth, the way they automatically go the way you want them to in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Do you always thank God for your food? Every once in a while I'll see a couple or a family bowing their heads in public in the restaurant. And it always thrills me a little, a little bit. I don't think people who do that do it to be seen. In fact, it takes a little courage to do it, doesn't it? To have people see you pray. So I think it's kind of okay to do that. And uh, the daily bread really means the necessities of life, not the luxuries. We thank God for giving us the necessities that we need. And then forgive us our debts moral debts as well as actual sins. Forgive us for coming up short, as Paul said in Romans 6, 23, 23, for we all fall short of the glory of God. We have sinned. And that's what we're talking about. Then he says, keep us from the testing time. It's amazing how we will wander into the testing experience. And most of us cannot measure up to the wilds of the devil, the temptation, the testing that he will put on us. We will fall by the wayside. So we should pray, God, don't, don't let us wander into it. Now, he does not lead us into it on purpose. Don't get that wrong. God does not lead you into temptation. He will allow you the freedom that might eventuate in your fumbling into this testing moment. Be careful when you do that. Don't put yourself knowingly in the testing moment. Now, what about this forgiving people? Oh, this is hard, isn't it? Right now, there's a half a dozen people in my family that I need to forgive. I need to quit carrying that grudge. I need to let it go. Just let it go. But I'm still mad at it. They did some despicable things. I'm sure you've got some people like that. I've read this over 20 times this weekend. I cannot find it saying anything else except if I don't forgive them, God is not obligated to forgive me. And that may not sound fair to you, but it's what Jesus told us, and not just once, but several times. You see, forgiveness is like electricity. If you've ever had an electrician come to your house to work on something that was not working, they always put on rubber gloves because electricity will not come in where it cannot get out. And the rubber gloves protect you or the workman from the electricity coming in. So forgiveness is like that. If it can't get out of you to someone else, it's not going to come into you. Now maybe that's a silly example, but I think it works. And then there's that great story about Elijah and James 5. Elijah was a man just like all of us are. He's a human being. Wasn't anything special. He wasn't a superman or a superwoman. He just was a guy. And he prayed one day that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed again that it would rain, and it rained. You've read that story, I hope. It's, it's in 1 Kings 19, 18 or 19, and it's also mentioned in James 5. Well, in the first century, the Jewish people were people who fasted and prayed. 
One time when the disciples couldn't help somebody who had a, an epileptic son, they asked him, how come we couldn't do it? He said, these things come by prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. So we have to think about that. I thought about it. I want to go on. I don't want to talk about fasting too much. What movie did I see this week? Gandhi. It's about the 12th time I've seen it. I know a lot of the dialogue. It is the most masterful piece of film I may have ever seen. Compared to Gone with the Wind, Gone with the Wind didn't have a chance. Because there, there are issues dealt with in the movie Gandhi that need to be dealt with every day. When Gandhi was fasting the first time, he wasn't just fasting. He was trying to force the nation to do something right by not eating. He was on a fast. And people were coming to him, please, please, please eat something. Uh, people have stopped fighting. They want, they're praying that you'll eat. And this one young lady came from Britain because she'd been writing to him. And he invited her to come if she wanted to work in his ministry. He said, you will be my daughter. And my wife will teach you how to spin homespun cloth. Still with me? And he says to her with a voice that was weakened by his having not eaten in weeks. He said, when I get despondent, when I despair, I always remember that in history, the way of truth and love always win. He said, the, the despots and the oppressors come and go, the murderers and they may look invincible for a time, but they always disappear. Always. That's something that can keep you from just being despondent. Just remember, no matter what the headlines say, no matter who is strutting across the stage of history, they won't be there forever. Now I can give you another verse that will back it up. Psalms 37. I saw the evil one like a green bay tree spreading out. Then I looked and he was gone. Gone. And that's exactly how it is. So the awesome power of prayer can be summed up in just a few words. And I want to close with this. How do you pray? Think as I speak. How do you pray? Most of us don't have time, or maybe the drive, the want to, to go find a closet. But don't worry about that. You ever heard of a water closet? It's a bathroom. I find a lot of good praying time in the bathroom. I find prayer at stoplights. You ever prayed at a stoplight? It'll make them go a lot faster. And then you can pray in doctor's offices. You know when you get to a certain age, you only go to places, funerals, and doctor's appointments. Well, pray during those times. And you'll find out that you have a lot of time to pray. I hope when you pray, you will shut your eyes. That helps you shut out the world. It's not important to do that, though, only. Jesus stood and prayed some. Remember the doc in the Bible? He stood up and prayed. Held his hands up. Talked to God out loud. One of the most powerful prayers I ever prayed was very private. But I was walking down the street and I was talking to God as loud as I could. Because I was confused. And I needed his touch. I hope you've had some times like that. There's no prayer language. Talk to him like you do your friends. Talk to him like you would your closest friend. And realize with your imagination who you're talking to. And then, finally, listen. Listen. I don't have time to go for what I had prepared. This is one of our old hymnals. Baptist hymnal. In it, there's a song. 
It says in the chorus, while I am waiting, yielded and still, yielded and still. Don't just say amen and run off. Stay there in your privacy and listen to God. You will not be disappointed. He will talk to you. Well, I don't know how to give the invitation because I'm not expecting you to come down. We don't really do that while we're in the pandemic. But I do want you to promise yourself that you will make a valid effort to pray more this week than you have last week. Just set a clock on yourself. Pray for five minutes. You'll find out how long five minutes is. Let's pray. Father, we are weak and we are undisciplined and we confess it to you because we know that if your temple was to be a place of prayer for the whole world, then every church has been built since had the same obligation, the same agenda. Forgive us, Father, for doing so many things in our church that have nothing to do with prayer. And teach us how to bathe everything we do with prayer. I thank you, Father, for a church that already knows this pretty well. And I pray that you'll help us during this pandemic to pray it through, that we'll get closer to you because we're scared, that we will talk about people we know who are sick and people who are hurt like Tiny. And I pray, oh God, that you will answer our prayers in a dramatic way, so dramatic that we will get the point. And I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing the song we sang.